The very first sermon I ever preached in a church was preached on the text that we're about to look at this morning. It was the summer of 1976, and I was a seminary intern with the Philadelphia Presbytery's Summer Evangelism Project, and the sermon was preached in an area of South Philly known as Chester in the First Presbyterian Church there, and it droned on and on and on for 45 minutes. But the people there were so kind. Now, hold on. Nobody leave. I'm not going to preach for 45 minutes this morning. But what I am going to try to do is get out of the way and let this text be life transformative in your lives and mine. Hopefully that we will leave here today with a complete assurance, a confidence in our salvation, gripped by an eternal security that the Lord wants you and me to have as his adopted sons and daughters. So I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles and keep them open to Romans chapter 8 as we look this morning at verses 26 through 30. And please pray with me before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it, and that we might faithfully apply it to our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. And now hear God's word directed to you and me this morning, beginning to read at the 26th chapter of Romans chapter 8. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Please pray with me again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, may they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Do you ever feel like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling? In one of Paul's other letters, he writes about the fact that you and I ought to be praying without ceasing. And I've always thought that meant that our lives pretty much ought to be sort of a running conversation with the Lord. But in verse 26 of our text, Paul reminds us that we are beset with weakness when it comes to prayer. That Oftentimes, you and I have not a clue how to pray or what we're to be praying about. Some of that's due to ignorance. Some of that may be due to the fact that we might be in dire straits. Maybe we're in a car wreck. Or maybe we've just had a stroke. Or maybe life's just coming at us from so many directions that we just can't think straight. Or maybe we're dazed and confused like, one of my pastor friends who took his wife to Paris this weekend for their wedding anniversary. And they emailed me and said, you know, it's just chaos here. We can hardly think straight. It's hard. We hardly know what to pray about. Or, or maybe we're in so much pain that, that we're just overwhelmed. We can't even put two thoughts together, let alone pray articulately or intelligently. My friends, when we're beset with that weakness, one of the ironies of the gospel of grace is that's at a time when we may be best covered by prayer. Because look at the amazing promise there in verses 26 and 27 of your text. It's at these times of weakness, Paul says, when you and I can't pray, when we don't know how to pray, that the Holy Spirit steps in. He intercedes for us. You know, last week we saw how the whole creation was groaning and we're groaning, and now we meet a third party into this, 
in this groaning business. It's the Holy Spirit himself as he intercedes for you and me. John Bunyan once said this about prayer. He said, it's better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. Here in our text, we see the Trinitarian nature of the exercise of prayer. Access to the Father through the Son by the groanings of the Holy Spirit who groans and sighs too deep for words. This Holy Spirit who knows you and me inside out, who knows the depths of our heart, who takes our deepest longings and confessions and pain and praise and takes those right to the very heart of God the Father. We're best covered in prayer when we can't pray, when we don't know how to pray because of the Holy Spirit, His intercession. And Paul says He always intercedes for us in complete conjunction with the will of God. I don't know about you, but even in my most articulate and intelligent prayers, oftentimes, My prayers are not in accord with God's will. But that's never the case with the Holy Spirit. You know, if you're in a court of law, you want the best lawyer possible to plead your case before the bar of justice. Think about it, my friends. When we are in our deepest weakness, when we've been stripped of our ability to pray, the Holy Spirit pleads our case before us In Jesus' name, in the very throne room of God the Father. My friends, never, never, never lose heart. And what about all of those things in life that slam into our lives, that knock the stuffing out of us, that knock the strength out of us, that strip you and me of our ability to pray? Sin, despair, disease, death, disappointment, tragedy, terrorism despair. Look at the most amazing promise in verse 28 of our text. Here, one of the crown jewel verses in all of Scripture. Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. My friends, memorize this verse. Carry it with you always to be your assurance, your confidence that no matter what happens to you in life, no matter what intrudes into your life, God is at work in and through those things, redeeming them, actually working through them in our lives to bring about His ultimate best for our lives. Is that Pollyanna thinking? My friends, Paul is no Pollyanna. Neither is the preacher standing in this pulpit this morning. Indeed, I could not, I would not preach on that verse if I did not know firsthand the veracity of that promise in the wake of burying one child and going through cancer with another. I remember 30 odd years ago, Louis Abendon standing in this very pulpit preaching on this very text. And he told a story, and I, I, I noted that in the margin of my Bible. He told the story about it his first year in seminary in Dr. Richardson's New Testament class. It happened to be a class on Romans. And one day they were drilling down deep on Romans 8, 28. Dr. Richardson expounding on this glorious promise. And after, shortly after that class was over, Dr. Richardson's wife and child were killed in a tragic train wreck. And he was plunged into the depths, into the abyss of grief and despair. And after the funeral, after the burials, when the next class day rolled around, Dr. Richardson showed up. And the students sat there wondering, there in his raw grief, what would he say now? Well, he began the class by quoting Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good 
for those who are called according to his purpose. And then he said, gentlemen, there were no females at Union Seminary in those days, God, God's plan still holds. And this is still God's world. We are still his people. Our work still matters. Still he works around and in and through and over all things. Do you see what God is saying through Paul here? That there's nothing that comes into your life and mine that he cannot redeem. There's nothing that slams into our lives that first hasn't gone through the very fingers of God. And he's saying that your ultimate destiny in mind, our eternal salvation, is something that's not up for grabs. It's not at the whim of fate or chance. But it's part of a plan, an ultimate plan that God is unfolding. What is God's ultimate plan? What is his supreme goal for your life and mine? Have you ever thought about that? Is it life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Is it that you and I might be um, wealthy and wise? Is it that uh, we might have our best life now? Is it to be an upwardly mobile, affluent North American Christian who has a nice home and 2.5 kids who are happy and successful and who has a nice retirement nest egg awaiting at the end of the line. Is that God's ultimate goal for your life and mine? No, no. What is it? Well, Paul lays it out very boldly in verse 29 of our text. Take a look. Here's God's ultimate supreme plan, his goal for your life and mine. It's that you and I would be conformed to the very likeness of his son. That you and I would be like Jesus someday. That's what the Holy Spirit is praying when he intercedes for us. When we don't know how to pray that or we're ignorant about that should be the priority of our prayer life, the Holy Spirit intercedes. He's praying that we might be conformed to the very likeness of Christ. And that's what God's doing in and through and around and over and all these events that come into our lives. He's using them to hone you and me more toward the likeness of his son. That's our eternal destiny, to be like Jesus. That's our ultimate destiny on the other side of death, that we might enter into the unveil glorious presence of Christ and be like Christ for eternity. Which means that these bodies, these finite fallen bodies that break down, will be traded in for a resurrection body. If I were in the unveiled glorious presence of God, I'd be vaporized. This body couldn't take it. But a resurrection body like Jesus' resurrection body, that will fit you and me for eternity. This is not going to happen by accident. This is not up for grabs. This is not something that's at the whim of fate or chance, my friends. This is the unfolding of God's plan of salvation and eternal destiny for your lives and mine. And Paul wants you and me to have that assurance so badly that in verses 29 and 30, he ends by laying out a chain, a golden chain that has five links that connects your eternal life, your eternal destiny and mine from one end of eternity to the other. He starts by saying it's all about God's foreknowledge. That before the foundation of the world, as Ephesians 1.4 puts it, God thought of you and me. You're not an accident in the universe. And that means, think about this, that means that there's never been a time when you and I have not had a unique and distinctive place in God's unfolding plan of salvation, not just for us, but for the redemption of the entire creation. And those whom God foreknew, Paul says, he predestined. Oh, there's that mysterious Presbyterian word that a lot of people buck against. 
because they, they don't really understand what it means. My friends, John Calvin said, the doctrine of predestination is not something to ever be argued about or debated. It's in Scripture solely for our comfort and our assurance, and I'm going to show you how that works. If you're here this morning, you don't believe the doctrine of predestination, well, all I can tell you is you're never going to have the depth of the assurance and confidence in your eternal destiny that God wants you to have. Let me give you a little illustration. It's my favorite about predestination. It's not perfect. There's holes in it. Because this is a great mystery beyond our full human comprehension. But I want you to picture a train track. And on that track, there's a powerful locomotive. It's only pulling one car. It's a box car. And that track has been laid by God. And it's leading to a specific destination. And that locomotive, that powerful locomotive, that is the power of God. It pulls the train. And in that boxcar, there's a fly. Now, no offense, but that's you and me. People come to me and say, Ron, predestination takes away our freedom, our free will. No, it doesn't. Think of that fly in the boxcar. Is he free to fly in any direction he wants? He can go up, he can go down, he can do loop-de-loops. That train is moving down that track. He can fly in the direct opposite direction that that train's going. Can he? But can that fly derail the train? No. Can that fly in his, all his loop-de-loops? Is, is that going to prevent him from arriving at the final destination? Guess what that box car is? Grace. Grace. You and I, as adopted sons and daughters of the Father, we are encompassed, surrounded, enveloped by God's grace. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you cannot get outside the bounds of God's grace, even when you mess up. That means our eternal destiny is not up for grabs, that God has given you and me his promise that he will ensure that we arrive where he wants us to arrive at the end of time and history, and we will enter his fulfilled kingdom where we will be glorified one day. And those whom God predestined, he also called. Remember Jesus in the graveyard, his best friend, Lazarus, is in the tomb, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. He spoke his name personally. If he didn't say Lazarus, the whole graveyard would empty. <laughs> there was a time in your life and mine before we knew Christ when we were spiritually dead as a doornail as Lazarus was dead in that tent. And then one day Christ came along. The Holy Spirit had fine-tuned our ear of faith to hear his still small voice as he said, Ron, come forth and follow me. And you and I answered that call. And those whom he called, he justified. Have you ever stood before the bar of God's perfect justice and wondered, how do I jump that? How do I qualify? How can I earn? How can I achieve that ultimate destiny, my eternal salvation? Well, you can't. You can't. You don't need to. My friends, the good news of the gospel of grace is that Jesus Christ has done everything for us. He's done what you and I cannot do and accomplished that once for all sufficient, perfect sacrifice on the cross that justifies you and me. It's like God takes the rope, uh, God the Father takes the robe of Christ's righteousness and places it around us so God the Father sees us through his Son as now righteous, justified before his bar of perfect justice. And those whom God justified, he also glorified. That is the final destination, my friends. Foreknowledge, predestination, called, justified, and one day you and I will be glorified. We will be exactly like God's son, Jesus, except we won't be God like Jesus is. We will have that resurrection body. We will bask in the glory of God, unfettered. Remember last week I said the early church, Father Irenaeus said, the glory of God is man fully alive. 
on your best day you've ever had here on this earth, you haven't even come close to knowing what it means to be fully alive. Then you and I will know. And that's not up for grabs. That's eternally sealed by God before the foundation of the world. If you believe that, you'll sleep better at night. And my friends, the barometer of God's love for you and me is how much of our salvation he's left in our hands. A man gave his testimony before a Christian group one time, how he came to Christ, and after the meeting, a guy, he was a little bit legalistic, uh, cornered him, criticized him, and said, you know, all you did was talk about God in your testimony. You didn't talk about your part in your salvation. You know, it's, part of it's God, part of it's us. And the man who gave the testimony said, oh, I'm sorry. I'll tell you about my part in it. My part is I ran as fast as I could all my life from God. And God's part was he ran after me, doggedly pursued me until he caught me. My friends, God loves you and me too much to place the most important thing, our ultimate destiny, in your hands and mine. I don't know about you. I played football in high school and college, and I've fumbled a number of times. Your salvation is in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he never, never fumbles. That ought to make you and me sleep better at night. Do you have that assurance? Do you have that confidence of your eternal destiny being sealed? Do you have the assurance of your salvation? If you're here this morning and you don't, slow down and let Christ catch you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.